Rowe and Lemmy Sores. And this is obviously going to be a very popular talk. I'll just make a um, couple of small references to uh, David's background in particular, which is, what was it? I had to write it down, 20 years, yes, that he's been in DSB-based telephony, which I think is um, really very interesting, but what's far more interesting is he built his own electric car. And the reason I find that really interesting, I'm probably the only guy here that's ridden my electric bike up here, so I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> Um, so, without further ado, anyway, I'll hand you across to David. Please give him a big welcome. Thank you. Okay, that working all right? Good. Hi, my name's David Rowe. Um, with my wife and I, I operate a small consultancy business we call Rotel. Um, my main interest, though, is using my technological skills, the kind of skills that many of you have to help people in the developing world. Um, my partner here is uh, Lemmy Soares. He's from Timor-Leste, which a lot of people in Australia call East Timor. Um, for the last 12 months, we've been working together on a project called the Dili Village Telco, uh, with the idea of uh, giving affordable telephony to uh, people in the developing world. Lemmy and I are going to be sharing the presentation and swapping a little bit back and forth with the slides. So, uh, with that introduction, I'll let uh, Lemmy talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be a geek in the developing world. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lemus Suarez. I'm working with the uh, NGO Forum. It's the umbrella organization in East Timor. Uh, uh, NGO Forum is the, we have like the 675 member of the NGO and uh, we provide them service like the uh, IT services and the uh, administration services and uh, capacity building training. Uh, as you know, that uh, East Timor occupied by the Indonesian uh, for 25 years, and uh, Timor was part Indonesian until 99. So I was born in Indonesian times, so I have to uh, go to the uh, Indonesian school, and I involved in the East Timor independence movement in 1996, uh, and refugees to the Portugal and stay for the four years in there and return back to the East Timor. Uh, with the skill uh, I was learning in the Portugal and I tried to develop my country in IT. So uh, my motivate to help my country is we think that after the 99, uh, militian burning all, uh, the whole territory no infrastructure, so no nothing in there. Uh, we think how to reboot again the East Timor. And I decided to work with the NGO Forum. It's an umbrella organization. And we tried to work in the uh, voice over IP because the internet is very expensive in then and telephone is very expensive. Uh, And a lot of problem we find in in developing world is the the first is the bandwidth. The second one is the, a lot of uh, computer and a lot of uh, they they use the pirate software, private software, but pirate software you can find in the shop for the three dollars. And the problem with the electricity sometimes is the you can like they only use electricity for the two hours and the electricity is break out. And a relative cost, it's meaning that it's hard to find the IT equipment in East Timor, like the rotor. A hundred dollar cost of rotor, it's the same like the 100 days, uh, 100 days is food for the East Timor people. And uh, shipping cost is very expensive. You buy the rotor is for the a hundred dollar, but shipping cost is a hundred dollar. So you have to buy rotor for the two hundred dollar US. And what's happened when the Malays goes home? Malays is meaning that for Asian people like you guys, we call you Malay in East Timor. It's very popular in East Timor. So 
we think that uh, in developing world, we should make some training is easy to the to the people to understanding and to learning how they can take over the system. And with the village circle project, we try to solve uh, some problem. Uh, the problem with the uh, mobile phone call is very expensive because we only expand in Delhi. It's like the three kilometers. Every time 500 meters, you have to use the GSM phone. And GSM phone is called one minute is 25 cent. And GDP for the for the uh, East Timor is the one dollar fifty cent. So the with the Villa Telco project, uh, we try to make life is different. And uh, we have set up like the 80 node of the village Telco in the East Timor, in the three district. I think uh, David will explain better about the, the sure. project. Thanks, Lenny. Yeah, so I'll just recap on a couple of those points. Just imagine what it's like. Um, you've got no bandwidth, ping times of several seconds to get to anything. And even if you've got bandwidth, your, power just, your computer won't work for three or four hours a day. Power goes off, boom, there's nothing you can do. Um, viruses everywhere, it's all pirated Windows software that <laughs> compounds the bandwidth situation. There's very little local expertise. Um, you know, how many of you learned Linux without asking someone help? Uh, so imagine trying to do that. And um, just to get involved in hacking, you might be talking about spending your food money for the next 100 days to buy something as simple as a router. So uh, you know, it's a different world for these guys, and uh, they face a lot of problems. What is the Village Telco? Um, the Village Telco is a mesh telephony network. Uh, the idea is we put one of these boxes called the mesh potato uh, around about TV antenna height uh, in villages. This is a picture of uh, a township in South Africa where the project originated. This deploys a fixed telephone line via Wi-Fi. So this just goes inside the home, looks like a regular telephone. Goes ring, ring. You can ring everyone else on the network. Uh, they mesh with each other. So your phone call goes through your neighbor's house down the street etc, etc, through the mesh network. No access points, uh, all the routers just carry traffic for each other. And then ideally at some point in the village there's some geeky guy who's running this whole thing. He maintains it and perhaps gateways your calls to the uh, rest of the world. Um, a group, group of us got together in 2008, decided to build the village telco, which is some hardware, a bunch of software components, all open source. After about a year and a half we thought we'd better test this. Um, so we uh, uh, obtained a grant from an organisation called the ISIF to do a deployment in uh, Dili, uh, East Timor, to test this thing for real uh, and make sure it works. So, the goals of the Dili Village Telco. First of all, very important goals to train the Team Marie's guys to install uh, the Village Telco. Um, so many cases, as Lemmy said, when the Malai goes home, when the foreigner goes home, everything breaks. Well-meaning foreigners come in, spend, inst they install things, and then as soon as they go, it, it just doesn't work. So we really want to overcome that barrier to deploying technology in the developing world. And uh, a lot of things in Linux are very intimidating for people who haven't had you know, exposure to the Linux command line and things like that. So we've had to put a lot of effort into making this thing easy to work and let the team Marie's employ things, uh, install things through Dilly. Um, the practical aims, install 100 mesh potatoes, uh, largest deployment to date. We just wanted to make sure this thing worked. Can people really make phone calls over it? Is it useful? Uh, and how well does it work uh, in various environmental and uh, other you know, Wi-Fi conditions? Um, the idea of that was to build a local telephone call network throughout Dili. Dili is the capital city of Timor-Leste, around three or 400,000 people, uh, and it probably spans um, 10 or 20 kilometres uh, in total uh, sort of area along either side. Um, the other possibility was because we're putting these things up and they use IP, we actually get an IP backbone as a side effect. Uh, now in Dili, if you need to send an IP packet from one side of the city to the other, you need to go up to a satellite, back down to Indonesia, back up to another satellite, and back down to another VSAT terminal to cover 500 metres. Uh, and that will all cost you um, at least $5 an hour to get that sort of access at dial-up rates. So uh, there's no local IP infrastructure, and we saw this as a way of introducing some. So some kid with an EPC can put up a web server and start distributing local content rather than going out of the country. So that was the sort of last goal. Um, this is sort of the idea of we have the network, a bunch of mesh potatoes, um, each of them having a telephone. The main aim of the network is telephony, uh, not data. But as a side effect, we could uh, connect up uh, Wi-Fi access points and people could connect with laptops uh, and then use the IP backbone as public infrastructure. 
Uh, at one end, we can connect a VSAT dish, and we can also be use the network to deploy IP. Mesh networks are used for internet connectivity in many parts of the world, a lot of community networks, so that's a, a very common use for them. Um, and then people can also connect PCs. Oh, and down here, the idea was to connect uh, some sort of gateway, and then um, so we could connect to the local telephone network, which is pretty much exclusively GSM mobiles. People in the developing world really don't have landlines. It's all GSM. So that was the plan, the network diagram. Uh, in terms of organisational, it's, it's a, uh, a partnership between uh, the small consultancy that I run and uh, Lemmy's organisation, which is somewhat larger. So uh, between, uh, I guess, an Australian organisation and a Timorese one. Uh, it's been funded uh, by the Internet Society Innovation Fund, which happens to be run here out of Brisbane, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's been running for around about 12 months. We're just winding up now. I've just returned from a visit to uh, Timor-Leste where we did a wrap-up visit and got to talk to some end users and we'll be finishing up in the next few months. Uh, the network, however, will go on. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, my role uh, in my organisation was to provide training and equipment. Uh, as Lemmy pointed out, it's really, really hard to get things into Timor. The postal system doesn't really work. If we mail something, it might get there. Um, which is kind of annoying when you're trying to run a project. And even then it'll sit in the post office for four weeks and Lemmy will have to go in and hassle the posties to dig it out of the big boxes of undistributed mail they've got sitting in the back. So you're down to couriers and you're talking about, I buy a router for $70 here, it's $170 landed in Dili. Uh, very painful to get things. Uh, a lot of the time we just took excess baggage over there. It was easier to fly there with 50 kilos of stuff than to try and ship it in. Contrast, contrast that to us. We get on the internet, click, click, click. A week later, the doorbell rings and something's come from halfway around the world. It's you know, much easier. Um, as I said, major theme, Fong Tu and the Team Marie's guys perform the installation. Um, and then they uh, run and maintain the network. What can go wrong? Uh, these were the, we wanted to look at the risks of the project. Um, what happens when the Malai goes home? Are these guys going to be continually emailing me for support? Uh, or are they going to be able to set it up and run it by themselves? Um, we really want to, we, we put in a lot of effort to train Timorese to fix problems. Um, it, these, inside the mesh potato, it's pretty much an open WRT router, like a WRT54. Um, heaps of Linux command files, you know, VIs in there if you want to mess around with it. But the simplest way to fix a problem, we just taught people how to reflash it. Anything goes wrong, just reflash it back to basics. Then you've got dial tone, and then you can start configuring again for there. From there. Configuration is very easy. There's a web GUI. I demonstrated this last year at, uh, in Wellington. There's a video of it. Um, we, we threw five of these out in the audience and I said, make my phone ring. And 10 minutes later, the guys in the audience had configured it and my phones were ringing. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. They were Linux geeks, so they were pretty sharp, so I didn't give them many instructions. But uh, with three or four hours training, we found that people in Timor can be trained to use and install these. Uh, simple web GUI, or you can even configure them via the telephone. All you have to do is set one IP. Um, so focus was on keeping the network running as well. Train many people, not just one expert. Common problem in the developing world is you, put, you, you get some guy, local guy, sharp guy, you maybe fly him overseas to Australia, train him up for six months, um, send him back to work on your NGO, and now that he's skilled, he can get a real job, real money, and he disappears. And you're back to, that's great for the company, uh, for the country, because I guess you're gradually educating people one by one, but it really messes with your projects. So uh, the way we got around that is to make the thing as simple to set up as possible. So if a guy leaves, it doesn't matter. There's three or four other guys who can do his job, or we can train another one up in half a day. Uh, uh, make it easier to set up, and how can we make it more reliable? Uh, some other risks we want to investigate. Okay, so now I now hand it back to Lemmy. Uh, Lemmy, we've got some photos to show you uh, how the training and deployment went in Timor. Yeah, this is the training we're doing in East Timor. We involve a lot of uh, women in IT stuff. And they're just training for the four hours. After that, they can go to the village and set up the uh, mess, mess potato. And the next slide, uh, we call the local manufacturer. So the, the, the Timorese guy can, can uh, put the PCB board to the uh, waterproof and cabling so they can do it by themselves and can employ a lot of people in this this uh, this area, and a lot of people very happy and get involved with this project because they are learning something new about the uh, uh, free free phone. 
and I think this one is the, we try to find another solution. If we don't have tower, we just put up in the coconut tree. <laughs> <laughs> but it's working fine. And after we put in the coconut tree, we can drink coconut for free. <laughs> <laughs> and the next slide is the, if you see in this image, it's the smile, it means that they're very happy with our service. So I think it's, the open source software is, you know, if you can create it one software and the value of the project, it's very important to help the you know, to community people. And we think is that the project is very cool for us and uh, a lot of people now use this, uh, uh, this uh, mashed potato project. Okay, thank you, Lemmy. Yeah, so I mean, you can see, that to me, that the smile on their face says it all. Um, that lady there is an NGO that supports women's rights in uh, Timor-Leste. So now she can make a phone call at a reasonable price to her colleagues uh, across the country. The guy behind it, his name is Arce, he's the guy who installed it for her. He's, I didn't train him, um, Lemmy trained him. So I was sort of out of the loop, they're training each other, installing things all over the country. Um, to help debug things, I coded up this simple Google Maps application over a weekend. Um, the idea is it shows a map of the mesh deployments. This is one part of Dili. Um, we've actually got sort of several clusters of nodes. This is sort of one at the eastern side. Um, down here, uh, near Lemmy's home base, the Fongtil organisation, you can see a bunch of nodes. And we've got some others up near the coast there with some longer links. The colours indicate the link quality. Um, it uses FPing to measure a running average of uh, packet loss on the fly. So every few seconds it'll be updated. Um, blue's good, red's okay, black has no connection. So this gives uh, Lemmy and the guys a real visual indication of uh, where the problems are with the links and the sort of connections the mesh network makes. Um, we use the Batman mesh networking algorithm. We don't know what it's going to do half the time. It just works out the best signal based on its own metric and uh, connects. So it's nice to know what the, how it's forming those connections. Then you can take action to improve them. Uh, or if you install a new node, you can decide where you might want to point your antenna, for example. One other trick it does, as well as measuring packet losses, it gives you the uh, signal strength of adjacent nodes. Um, that's useful to compare. If you get something that's really weak that you should know should be really strong, you might, say, choose to reposition your mesh potato up on its mast. Outcomes. We've deployed around 70 nodes out of the 100 we've got. Um, there's a lot of demand for more. It, it has proven very easy to set up. I, I really feel we've exceeded our, our aims there. Um, I'm amazed at how easy it is to set up and how quickly uh, they're rolling out. We have some problems with 20% uh, of the mesh links due to Wi-Fi interference in Dili. When you've got no fixed line infrastructure, like DSL lines, everyone uses Wi-Fi and it's a, it's a fairly polluted sort of uh, spectrum there. Uh, we have team Marie's, training team Marie's. We have some second generation training, so guys I train to training others. I'm really excited about that because that makes the system viral. If we can pump the hardware into the country, one person trains the other, trains the next person, there's no limits uh, to how many can be installed. So that's one of the most exciting things for me. Um, some other examples, just things we can't understand here, um, but the reason we do pilots is things like it's saving people three hour walks. Um, in some cases you might have a village, you can see part of it, but it's down a valley and up a hill. Um, it might only be a thousand metres away, but it might be three hours of tracking through jungle to get there. Now someone can pick up a phone and call that person. So the, what's the economic value of three hours of your time that you could be using that for? So that's a real example of why people in the developing world can really use telephony, especially when other infrastructure is pretty bad, like roads and things like that, that uh, we take for granted. Um, another example, uh, in a village, uh, where there's no GSM coverage at all, which is a, large, a fairly large part of the country. They're using this to connect places like the police, ambulance, NGOs. Uh, a common example is there'll be different campuses of the university across Dili, so they'll connect them using mesh potatoes. That way they can make support calls every few hours that are not on time calls. And as you know, to debug a computer support program, you need a lot of time. You don't want to be waiting on a time phone call. So they're the sort of applications that are being used. A lot of applications you want to ring a service, not a person, so a fixed line is actually better. If you're ringing the police, you're not after a police officer, you're after the police station. So having a fixed phone is actually uh, better than a mobile in some cases. Um, and one thing that I think is cool, it's really helping people every day. I saw that when I was over here. Um, all the wonderful Linux and Asterix software and things that, that you guys have helped develop is, is out there helping people in the developing world, and I, I think that's pretty cool. Um, one funny thing we had to do was some landline training. Um, 
Some, as I said, because GSM is so predominant and um, East Timor's had such a bad time over the last 20 odd years, no one had seen one of these over there. So they'd make a phone call and just put this down. So we had to train them to do this. <laughs> uh, the sort of thing we take for granted, but uh, they'd never had to do. Okay, what worked? Uh, the ease of setup, the training's pretty good. Um, we, it sort of grew a bit bigger that we started off in Dili, uh, but then we were, due to popular demand, we were asked to expand it into a couple of other villages, which let, let us test it in some more rural areas, which was good in a way because there's no, inter, no Wi-Fi interference in the more rural areas. Um, and it was good for them because some of these villages didn't have any other connectivity at all. The GSM network wasn't present, so we got to you know, help them in, in different ways. Uh, apart from just saving money, just actually giving them telephones. Everywhere I went, the end users were very happy, keen to expand it. Um, and uh, there was very strong demand to get more in, expand the network. As the, as the, as the utility, as, as the number of nodes expands, the utility of the network increases, obviously, the more people you can call. Surprisingly, though, even with just a few phones, it's still very useful because many people are making calls to the same place all the time. Uh, as Lemmy said, because there's no PABXs or landlines, um, even if you want to ring a couple hundred metres down the road, um, people are using GSM handsets or the next office. Um, so to be able to do that for free uh, is a wonderful thing for them. And it surprises me every time when it rings. You really can make phone calls over this. Um, as an engineer, I'm exposed to some of the complexity inside this and the hundreds of hours I've spent messing around compiling OpenWIT and writing drivers and uh, having asterisks crash and things like that. But it does work every day and I'm continually surprised about that. <laughs> what went wrong? Nasty interference in Dili. It's a very polluted Wi-Fi spectrum. Um, these have little omnidirectional antennas, but sort of by definition with the mesh network you don't know where the next node's going to be. So you need to be able to pick up from any direction. Unfortunately that means it's terrible for interference and what we're having to do now is put some, some of these with directional antennas on them or devices with directional antennas or 5 gigahertz gear to over, overcome some of the bad links. We had the usual schedule slips and staff movement, but that's really just delayed some of the rollout. It, hasn't, uh, it won't stop the project going right through to completion. Um, the ease of use mean breaks down in some cases, um, and we find we're back on the command line. At the moment, you don't need to go near the Linux command line to configure these things. As I said, rather than that, I just taught them to reflash uh, and move from there. But in some cases, if you want to do something a bit tricky, like say gateway it uh, to the rest of the world or um, use a 5 gigahertz link using third party equipment, then you need to go back to uh, the Linux command line, mess around with some comp files, ping IF config, that sort of thing. So the ease of use meme still has some help. Uh, we still need some help, I guess, to make that a little bit better. There is a bit of reliance on third party hardware. Um, I'm not against that, but I just hate the idea that we have to ship stuff in from overseas because it's triple the price that you pay in a first world country. So it's, a, it's an economic issue um, uh, for us to use third party hardware and it's something I'd like to remove. Um, an example is if we need a directional antenna in Australia, they're $115. It'll be over 200 by the time we get it to Dili. So to overcome that, I'd like to say work out a way for the local guys to manufacture antennas uh, using local materials, which will give them something to do, make them feel pretty cool, and uh, uh, you know, make it a fraction of the price. Something else that went wrong was uh, the business model we had behind this. Um, you need some sort of ongoing income to support this thing. You know, a mesh node falls down, something needs reflashing. The idea we always had with the village telco was there'd be some guy in the village who would um, connect to the rest of the world and sell you know, external phone calls at a, at a profit of a few cents a call or something. But no one's interested in connecting to the GSM network or the outside world uh, in East Timor. They just want to make local calls. That's the killer application. When I talked to Lemmy about, um, I said to him, you can call anywhere you want in the world. He said, who am I going to call? You know, he just wants to call people down the road at a reasonable price. Some of the surprises, how bad Wi-Fi interference can be. Um, we had cases of uh, equipment with directional antennas that couldn't penetrate 300 metres. Um, one of the reasons was we were going straight over the UN compound where there's heaps of radios and other microwave gear and <laughs> helicopters. But we didn't ask them to put a compound up there. Um, killer app for VoIP was local calls, which is sort of still strange for me. Every time we think of VoIP, it's cheap long distance calls, right? So that's one of the things you have to do pilots to find out. Um, that's not true of all village telco deployments. The, apart from East Timor, there's others going on in other parts of the world, but in our particular implementation, um, it's local calls. Um, when you see people make the calls and receive them and the enthusiasm they have with it, it's like they're getting a free gift every time. You've got to remember, uh, a phone call for them is like an hour or two hours wages. 
So that's the value. So you think about your hourly rate. That's someone's getting a free gift. And when you use it, you can see how happy they are and, and how enthusiastic. And that's one of those things you really have to get into their minds to understand why it's so important to them. And, you know, this, uh, the wonder of a local call that we take for granted. Um, the ease of installation is looking good. Um, I've done myself out of a job. I won't be required for the next project. Uh, it's also very popular on another level. Um, Fongtil, the organisation that Lemmy works for, they have multiple projects, 30, 40 projects running at once. They all want to work on the village telco. Um, there's something about it. They like drilling the boxes, installing things, climbing the coconut trees, uh, making phone calls. So we've hit on some sort of formula there, and this was totally unexpected, that makes people really want to work on this project. And that obviously makes it a lot easier to roll out when people are enthusiastic about it. Uh, and the demand, local demand, has been unprecedented. Um, I was sitting next to Lemmy for two weeks earlier this month, and um, he had to keep interrupting me because people were walking in from other NGOs and saying, hey, I want mesh potato, mesh potato. I don't understand anything else in the local language, but I know mesh potato. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I was just watching this and I thought, wow, you know. Uh, so they're all, and the sort of people who come to him are IT managers for, say, an NGO that might have four or five campuses, and they want to they link each other so they can make calls between their campuses, sometimes over a few hundred metres or a few kilometres. But what's going to happen is they all start installing is our mesh is suddenly going to link together and we'll be covering the whole city and then maybe the country. It's not very big, a few hundred kilometres from end to end, so it's not that unforeseeable that we could start bridging some of the villages and towns as well using this technology. I've discovered a little bit about patience. Um, it's very different to the first world. Um, I've been sitting there and suddenly, boof, the lights go out, the fans stop turning, the, all the PCs go off, and you just got to sit around for two or three hours. There's nothing else you can do. And it drives me nuts, but these guys, they're just used to it. You know, they're really patient. Um, and imagine trying to do IT in that environment. Uh, the other thing I've found is the usefulness in partial functionality. Um, when I went there, there were several clusters of nodes that weren't really talking too well to each other because of these interference problems, and I thought, you know, this is a not doing too, not doing very well at all. But then people were loving it. Um, despite that, just the partial functionality, the ability to be able to call, say, 10 people rather than 60, or 30 people rather than 100, was still very, very useful to them um, because it's so much better than what they've got. Uh, the very high expense of uh, phone calls in, in many developing world countries. Um, so the usefulness and partial functionality was a real surprise to me. Um, the sort of projects Lemmy does, about one out of five actually work this well. There's a lot of fa very high failure rates. You'll get well-meaning first world people come in for a month, disappear, and it'll break, no one can fix it. That happens again and again and again. So, you know, we've done pretty well to score a success with this one, I think. Um, the other thing with them is it's okay if it takes a few months. You know, I figure a year's long enough to get this thing running, running but Lemmy's a lot more patient than me, and he says, no, we know what to do now. Uh, you know, we know there's a few dud links, but You've shown us how to fix it and how to install these things, and we're sure we can get it running now. And we can do it. That's what he said. What he means by that is the local guys can do it now. So they're quite happy to wait a few more months to get this thing humming along because they can do it themselves. The future. Um, Lenny and the team are working on expanding the network through this year. They've still got a few more mesh potatoes to roll out, a few links to fix. Um, working on the business model, um, people, instead of, say, billing per call, perhaps some sort of subscription model, you know, you get a mesh potato for a dollar a month, we'll look after it for you. Um, they do have enough money to buy, you know, $50 for a phone and that sort of thing is doable. They spend that already on mobiles. It's just a little bit too expensive to use. Um, and what's kind of cool is that the grant money's run out now, but Lemmy's organisation, and remember these aren't rich organisations, but they've put a substantial, I think it's 30, 40% of this year's IT budget into expanding the mesh potato. So of all the things they could spend, uh, the, their Dilly Village Telco network is what's got most of their income. Um, and that's pretty cool. And that's really un unusual in the development scene. Um, in the, a lot of development money doesn't always get spent that well. And uh, it's pretty unusual for the developing world people themselves to decide to keep pushing a project forward after it's finished. Um, so I'd just like to thank the people from the ISIF, Sylvia in particular. Uh, he's sitting back there. His hand up, yep. Her organisation funded it and she's been helping us uh, manage the project. Um, Atcom, a Chinese company who we've partnered to make the mesh potato. Um, and they, they came with us to Timor a few weeks ago and they were thrilled to see their hardware they could make. Um, and these guys are great at, everyone in China is great at manufacture. 
but they were thrilled to see that helping people in the developing world. So they made a special batch of mesh potatoes just for this project and went to a lot of work to procure low-cost telephones and, and things like that, and no one does that better than the Chinese. The Shuttleworth Foundation, they funded the Village Telco development over the past couple of years. That's a, a foundation based in Cape Town, um, started by Mark Shuttleworth, who's also behind uh, Ubuntu. Um, there's a community of Village Telco people, um, I'm just one of them, uh, and uh, we've got a wiki there. So thank you. Thank you very much, David and um, Lemmy. Uh, we have got uh, quite a few minutes before lunch, and I'm sure there'll be questions. If you can just raise hands, I'll get round you with the mic, see how I'm holding it. Just speak straight in like that. Thank you very much. Right, questions, we'll start here. No, sorry, we'll start here, and we'll sort of go around that way. Hi, David. I just wanted to know how much a mesh potato costs. They're $120 retail about $80 in quantity 100, and our target is to push it down to around 60 uh, unit. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of Wi-Fi wi interference problems. Have you ever seen the R-O-N-J-A project? Oh, the optical links. The optical links. I have been exposed to that, yes. Because that um, that's probably what you'll have to use in the worst areas because that was what they found over in one US city, mm. is that optical in particular... Um, optical was the only option in particular areas. Yeah, yeah, great idea. It's very directional. I was just wondering how you're handling uh, addressing and numbering for the phones. Are they being done on a per region basis or is there some grand plan to link them all together? Oh, it's pretty ad hoc at the moment. Um, these, the phone number is your IP and you can just dial the IP or the last octet. Um, there's also a server package we put together that you can use to set up an arbitrary dialing scheme. So how do you handle power outages? Power outages, the network goes off. Well, that works. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as I said, the patience of those people means that's okay. Because when it goes on, they can make a free phone call. However, we are looking at battery backing these. People originally thought of solar, but actually the real problem is periodic outages. So a small battery backup would be ideal, like a little lithium battery inside. Uh, you were talking about sort of ultimately scaling the network to the whole to the whole country, or at least spanning it. Um, how how well do mesh networks scale on on that sort of thing? Has there, has there been any deployments of that kind of size? Yeah, I'm aware of networks up to 500 in a single mesh. After that, it's sort of IP technology. So you. Bridging to IP networks. So, so you'd, you'd sort of look at bridging bridging groups of the meshes rather, yeah. than, rather than having it mesh end to end. You'd probably use the mesh routing algorithm, but you use different subnets and more traditional sort of IP network design for the, for the real long distance stuff. Hi, I'm just wondering what you're finding, what kind of range you're getting between units on average. Sure. Yeah, except for the really bad spots. Yeah, uh, if you take interference away, it's regular Wi Fi. So it's the same sort of thing as sticking your laptop up on them. A high pole. Um, I've made phone calls over two kilometres between a couple of jetties in Adelaide in perfect conditions. Yeah. Typically we're looking at you know 50 to 200 metres. Uh, that's not a, a limit, it's just where they happen to go up. Don't be afraid to kiss the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering about, uh, I guess Paul's talking about people, I guess, taking bits of copper wire and, and all that sort of thing, like what, what sort of mechanisms have you got to, uh, I guess, one is to, to stop stop it being pilfered and repurposed and I guess, you know, I, I, I guess around privacy concerns, uh, is, is that another issue as well, particularly, I guess, being under a, previously under a regime that was oppressive, I, I guess there may be some right. issues there. We haven't encrypted anything. In terms of theft of the mesh potatoes, Lemmy, have you had any... Have you got any concerns about people taking the mesh potato uh, from installations? Have any disappeared overnight? Not yet. No. What? <laughs> what would be the um, the cultural things there, perhaps in Timor? You know, are people likely to take it, or is everyone watching all the time? Or you don't mess with the Timorese, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just come from the bat phone talk. Yes. Do you have much? Um, cross-pollination with that project? Yeah, we do quite a lot. We're on the mailing list together and Paul's been a big contributor. They use fundamentally the same technology. He's just got what's running on that running in an Android phone. Yeah. 
Uh, how have you found durability for the phones with the uh, conditions that have been? It's been up? pretty good. Um, we've had these things up in a tropical environment now for about a year, and uh, we get a lot of humidity, which is pretty hard on electronics, electrical storms, and none have popped that I know of. Yeah. Well, the, the design to stand nearby hits. They've got a lot of. We've designed a lot of protection into them. Direct hit, no. But there's nothing conductive on the outside either. Yeah. I'm just wondering what sort of organisation has been left behind, like in terms to support the the, the telco. Right. Like you well, let, let's run out of uh, the Fongtil organisation. Lemmy is the IT manager, and so they're just running it as an ongoing uh, concern. Yeah, it's part of their mission to encourage uh, this sort of thing. Mm. Um, the OLPC project had a scheme going, give one, uh, uh, get one, give one. And, and it, I guess a lot of geeks are very interested in getting on, on the cool, cool hardware, but also supporting um, yeah. such things. Have you thought of, you know, uh, making the hardware available or, or, or making it easy to be more available to geeks and then we could, say, buy one for use in... in that, team or that's a great idea. Yeah, one of the issues is, um, you know, hundred odd dollars is still a bit expensive for these people, and if we could come up with ideas like that, that that's a wonderful way to subsidise it. Yeah. You were talking about um, being able to do IP over over the mesh as well. Um, is there any QoS so that um, you know bandwidth doesn't get no. disproportionately used? No, okay. not yet. We sort of. The, the basic rule is voice first, and then when we get to data, we'll look at QS. It's all open WIT, so it's a matter of someone getting in, compiling it in, and handling the configuration. Um, how are we going to handle uh, future upgrades, future firmware revisions, new versions of Asterix, new versions of Batman, all that sort of stuff that's going to happen over the next few years? Yeah, they have the ability to be reflashed in situ. So you can even reflash over Wi-Fi if you're really, really careful. Do you have an organisation to do that? Do you have an um, organisation to do we, that? We or? have some people developing the software as part of the Village Telco community. And so there's periodic releases of uh, release software and, uh, you know, experimental software. You just have to be a little bit careful when you're reflashing anything over Wi-Fi because you don't want to climb a 20-metre mast if you brick it. <laughs> <laughs> or tree. Are there any pa any plans to look at IPv6 for them, or are you sticking with IPv4? It's uh, an absolutely ideal now? application for IPv6 because we want to make these things by the hundreds of thousands. And uh, the issue at the moment is um, someone's just got to do it. So it's all open source. The same firmware will run on any open WIT device, and you can buy these over the internet from a web store if you want to hack on them. Oh, cool. Mm. Thanks. Any others? How do the existing telcos view you? Uh, what does Timor Telecom think of us, uh, Lemmy? The existing telco, what's their view? Uh, I think that uh, this is uh, one part of our advocacy to make the prices low. So I think it's no problem with the Timor Telecom. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're under their radar a little bit probably at the moment. The other thing is um, like we had to face this question for the grant application because we, we couldn't do anything illegal, for example, with this. And uh, when Lemmy researched it, um, there's no laws for VoIP or Wi-Fi in Timor. The whole country was rebooted 10 years ago. So, you know, spectrum, I doubt there's a spectrum analyzer in the whole country. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, at, at the moment this is uh, totally legal, but obviously, you know, as we get a bit more, we'll have to deal with it at some point. Hopefully we can work with them. Yeah. The government is, however, very supportive because everyone sees uh, expensive telephony as a bad thing. Nobody really cares what spectrum you're using. How easy is it with software to change your frequencies? You're limited by the Wi-Fi chipset. So we sort of can operate on some of these channels they only have in Japan and that sort of thing if we want to. Also, Wi-Fi channels overlap. Channel 1 overlaps the channel 4 or 5, so it only gets you so far. The best use is spatial reuse with directional antennas if interference is a problem. So beyond supporting the system, is there any work on actually getting the team areas up on actual development and, and building firmware and that sort of thing? Did that happen or is that not likely to happen? Inside Timor? Yes. No. No, just installation and that sort of thing. Okay. That'll happen. This is the first step, you know. You, yeah, yeah. I, I, I yeah. realise. Baby steps. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to give this people this scaffolding. You need this small step. Uh, and 
a lot of the times it's just really hard to get started in these places. If any of you guys want to go to Timor and do a little bit of Linux, database, web, you'd be very welcome by Lemmy and his crew. And it'd be a real cool way to help out. And they really need skills and people who can um, teach those skills over there. Other questions? All done. Very good. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, present you with, um, I hope, uh, something that can go back to Delhi. And yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please, we've had a, a full house. It's been a terrific uh, presentation. Uh, please thank David and Lemmy again. Thank you.